Okay. All right, let me see if everything's looking good because we're doing a live stream. Live stream, it's been a while since I've done this. In this live stream, looks like sounds going, so that's good to hear. In this live stream, I'm gonna be working on this skull sculpture. It was a life-size realistic skull. And now I'm going in and I'm gonna be just cleaning up the line work. I've simplified it and stylized it in, into kind of my style. And I'm um, just gonna be kind of having fun with it and cleaning things up. This part of the process takes quite a while, especially if you wanna get it to a fairly smooth and fine finish and really clean up this line work. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be working on during this uh, sculpting session. If you have any questions, I'm also um, open for that. If you do, just let me know what uh, questions you might have. And this is kind of the style of video that I usually do for my Patreon patrons. It's kind of more like showing the entire process. I try not to cut a lot of it out. And then we usually do like one hour sculpting sessions where you can sculpt along and there's a bunch of projects that have to do with figure sculpting and portrait sculpting. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the link down below for my Patreon. If you're interested in sculpting courses, which are more structured, they're more edited and kind of like, um, yeah, just more condensed videos. So if you want things that are a little bit more um, like assignments and showing you how to do it, demos that are shorter, then the sculpting courses, the figure sculpting course and the portrait sculpting course are well worth looking into. Uh, those are over at proco.com and you can find those links down below as well. Um, so right now what I'm gonna be doing is just taking little pieces of clay and building out the, the line work, trying to clean things up, trying to remove some of the marks that I've left uh, previously and so um, just taking, if I need to, little pieces of clay or just kind of smoothing out the surface by dragging this flat tool across the surface and trying to refine and define all of the uh, forms, all of the line work, and make that pretty symmetrical from side to side um, because this is a symmetrical sculpture, or at least it should be. And so that's what I'm going to be working on. Let's see, recently I there was a sharp plane change between the mound of the mouth, or the tooth cylinder, and the mental protuberance, or the chin. But then I decided to smooth that out, and, and so um, now it's a little bit more of a sl smooth, sloping transition. And I feel like it's kind of like these transitions here, which I like, and then having the sharp edges on the outside transitions, I just thought that that looked a little bit better. And so that's what I decided to go with. But the nice thing about working these, uh, doing this kind of stylization is you can experiment with different things. You can try um, adding, adding transitions or the transitions, you can make them a little bit different. Some of these, for example, some of these outside corners, like here, I could go in and smooth it out or I could move the lines a little bit. In fact, something I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna get rid of this transition right here on the forehead. I just think it looks kind of silly. There is kind of these bumps right here above the eyes that kind of go like this um, in the skull. And so that's why this was there in the first place. But looking at it now, I think I just want this to be a simple plane for the, for the frontal bone, that forehead. So I'm just going to go ahead and take some clay and just spread it out and then smooth it out with this tool. And this clay, uh, people always like to know what type of clay that I use. This is Chavant Medium NSP Clay. And I've actually mixed a little bit of hard clay in with this because I prefer the clay a little bit harder. But um, but if you like it softer, if you're doing larger projects or you just prefer a softer clay, 
you can look at the just the medium or even the soft clay. The things with those is that the detail work is a little bit harder when the clay is soft because like if I grab the sculpture like I'm doing here with soft clay, it can just mess up the forms that I've already established. So I prefer a little bit harder clay and then you can warm the clay up for um, if you want it to be softer. That's the nice thing about this clay. If you're using a water-based clay, if that's what you prefer or if that's just what you can afford because it's cheaper, water-based clay is great because it is so versatile. It can be very hard. You can, you can kind of let it dry out to the point where it's uh, almost like plaster and you can sculpt it. Or it can be so soft to the point where it can't even hold together. You know, it's just slush depending on how much water content is in there. So depending on how hydrated the clay is, it can really be very versatile. So that's the nice thing about natural, natural clay, clay or ceramic, ceramic clay, water-based water -based clay. They're all the, the same, same thing. thing. Um, but, but this, this, this clay, clay, the nice thing, thing about, about it is it doesn't, doesn't dry out, so I don't have, have to worry about covering it. it. And, and I, I can, can come back and work on it whenever I want. And for my sculpting style, that's, that's just a little, little bit more convenient for me because sometimes, sometimes I'll leave a project for a while and I don't want to have to worry about, about it uh, molding or drying out. So, so I just prefer a, a clay that I can leave for a while and then come, come back and finish. And that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the nice thing about this, this, this type, type of clay. But, but whatever, whatever type, type of clay you have, uh, can, can work. If you, you have, have just natural clay, clay that's, that's great. great. I mean, that's, that's what most sculptors have used throughout history, history. and it's, you know, it's, it's natural, natural, it's organic. It comes, comes right, right from, from the earth. earth. You, you can, can even make your own. I've seen videos on YouTube on just how to make your own water-based clay. I should do a, a video on that because it really is um, not, not, not uh, difficult, difficult to find. find. Let's see. So I'm just, just taking little, little pieces of clay, pressing them on the surface, and then spreading them out to try to smooth out the texture. I don't want to have the forehead be, be too rounded. I'm going to check it a little while. Another thing that helps you uh, to check it is you can just, uh, I can just pick it up and look at it from above and make sure that the, the line work or I should, I should say, say the silhouette from this side looks, looks good, that it looks symmetrical. It's a little bit easier to see than looking at it um, straight on. Straight on, on is kind of difficult to know exactly what is what is happening and if it's if each side is symmetrical. If one side was coming out a little bit farther or more rounded, that would be hard to see looking at it from the front view. So constantly changing the angle that you're observing your sculpture from can really help you, especially when you're doing something like this or a portrait where it needs to be symmetrical. It should be symmetrical. That's a lot easier to see when looking at it from above or from below. And if you're if you're interested in this type of stuff, if you like sculpting, I really hope you'll check out the Proco sculpting courses, the, the courses that I've developed. There's a figure sculpting course and a portrait sculpting course. Um, both of them are really helpful. Both of them have lots of free content. So the free videos are posted over at the Proco 3D YouTube channel. That's the, the Proco 3D YouTube channel. Um, P-R-O-K-O is that, is um, how you spell that. And that's where all the free videos. But then if you also just go to Proco.com and look at their, their, their courses, you can search my name, Andrew Joseph Heath. And, um, and my, my courses, courses are listed under my profile. And it's, it's kind, kind of like, like a social media um, platform almost, but, but it's for art students. So if you're interested in drawing, painting, or sculpting, it's just, just a great resource. There's tons of free content. And then the, the, the full premium courses, it's crazy. You can learn from some of the best artists in the world for you know less than the cost of a of a textbook in college, and I went to college for sculpture, and uh, and I had a couple of good teachers. Mostly, they were lackluster, and so I built the courses so that other people could have kind of the education that I wish I would have been able to get if I if I could have started over. So that's kind of 
what I had in mind when I built the courses. And uh, so if you're interested in sculpting, I really recommend you check those out. Double mic, uh, double mic audio. Oh, shoot. Let me see if I can fix that. Let's see. Let's see. Is that better? Um, testing, testing. Let me know if that's better content guy. I appreciate it. Um, this is my first time doing a live stream in a while, and I've only done a couple. So it is uh, incredible, the technology that we have, but I'm still learning it, and OBS and everything is, is still new to me. So trying to figure everything out is still Echo. Really interesting. Let me try audio capture. Oh, let me let me see if this testing testing one two three. Let's see. Is that better? Does that sound better? Hopefully that sounds a little bit better. Yeah, figuring out the audio. I was trying to. I don't even know if this mic. I don't think the audio is coming from this mic. I think it's just coming from my laptop because it wasn't uh, registering when I set up my camera, the main camera that's sculpting this. Um, it didn't register the audio, so I got to figure that out. But uh, it was time for the live stream, so I couldn't spend that much, much time. Perfect. Okay, hopefully that helps. I appreciate that a lot. It's nice when, uh, when something's off and you get a, a notice early on to change it. That's good to know. Okay, so like for right here, I don't know if you can see very well, but it's kind of losing that. Um, let me actually move this over just a little bit. It's kind of losing this transition right here. It's kind of softened a little bit. In fact, I can do it a little bit more just to show you if this was just the rounded sculpture, there was no transition right here, how I would go about building this line work, this transition so that there's a clean line right there. So I just take a little piece of clay and then I would press it coming from one side and I try to get kind of one side cleaned up first, then come from this other plane it's the side of the head and just kind of clean that up. If there's a little bit extra, I can take that off and then come at it from, from both sides, just kind of scraping that edge and cleaning things up a little bit. So just like that, you can see that the, here the corner is not that well defined because I've changed things a little bit. So just taking a little bit of clay and then I'm just going to try to clean up this right here. And coming at it from each from each plane to try to make sure that that is a nice clean transition. See this, I feel like can come in a little bit more. Right like that. <laughs> Somebody says, ooh, that's clean. Yeah, so, um, so it's really just, you know, a matter of time coming at it from different angles and I'm trying to do the the best I can to clean everything up um, this on this side you can see that and on the back there's a lot that needs to be cleaned up just going over everything so let's go ahead and do some of that so these are these marks that you see that's just me laying in the clay smoothing it out by hand and so then I'll come in with this this tool, maybe add a little bit of clay if I feel like I need to to fill in some of the 
like some of the grooves in between the the texture that's left with me just spreading the clay out. So sometimes I'll just add some clay and then sometimes I might just come in and smooth out the clay that's already there. Just coming. But I'm really just trying to make it uh, make it more smooth and nice. Let's see. Lovely. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like I like this style. It's fun to uh, stylize things. It was, it's fun to sculpt realistically as well. Oh, I'm kind of blocking the camera there. It's fun to sculpt realistically, and then also it's fun to um, abstract things. Oh yeah, viewer latency. Yeah, yeah. My uh I think my internet is a little bit slow. So it'll be a little bit uh it'll take a little little bit for things to come through. But I imagine most of the people that'll be watching this will be watching after the stream is is done. Which is fine because I haven't set up like a consistent time to do streams weekly. Though I should, I, and I, I'd like to, and now that I'm, um, now that I've moved, so I'm back in, uh, back, back home out of my studio space, so there's some drawbacks to that, not as much space, but the benefit is now I have internet again, where I work and where I record, so now I can do, hopefully more uh, live streams and hopefully be consistent with those because it is it is fun but just setting it up and scheduling it is sometimes a uh, a hassle there's always other things to do so yeah content guy I appreciate the the uh, the comments and letting me know about the sound that's something that I really appreciate when people are like oh there's something off and it, I would have just kept going for the whole stream. So here you can see it's starting to clean up a little bit more. This is what it was like before and now a little bit cleaner. Um, a little bit more smooth. This clay, um, even with this style, I'm not going to go for like a perfectly smooth finish here if I was going to do that what I would probably try to do is well I might have to cast it twice so I might have to mold it and then cast it in plaster and then sand it so that it's basically perfectly smooth and then cast it again mold it again and cast it again but I don't mind this like lightly tooled texture as long as the line work is clean as long as um, the surface is fairly clean I don't mind it, it that much, so I probably won't won't worry about it that much. And then I want to I want to try to keep the center lines in place. You can see that I've drawn them, but sometimes they'll they'll start to get lost as I'm texturing. And I want to keep those in place because that really depends on you know where the these lines are coming off. If I if the center line is off or if I have have lost it, then those forms won't look right. Um, it won't it won't be uh, going very good, or it won't uh, be symmetrical as I want. So let's see. So there's um there's a hole in here. You can see that hole right there. What that's for is once I'm finished and I'm pretty happy with the consistency of this. I'm going to put this just on a, a metal pipe right here like that and then I will um, and then I'll use that as I'm making the mold and right here is where I'm going to pour in so that I'll build out a little uh, basically kind of like a funnel into the mold the seam will basically go down the center line and then I'll pour the plaster or resin or whatever I use into this area right here and that way all of the details of the face 
um, the, the bubbles will move away from those details. And if there are any bubbles, they'll be in this area and it's a little bit easier to clean up than the, the detailed part of the face. So if you're wondering what that is or why it's there, that's the story of that hole in the back of the head. Let's see, so just coming back, let's do a little bit more over here on this side. Yeah, so uh, recently I was um, suspended from Instagram, but I guess it was apparently like an Instagram. It was like some sort of fluke, and there was a lot of people that were that were suspended, um, and it was just a technical thing. I got it back the same day, but that man, that really makes me nervous. It really made me nervous because as a content creator, you know, somebody that that makes online courses for a living, and then I use the content that I make on. Uh, YouTube, but especially Instagram. Instagram is like where I've mainly focused and I built it up to like 80, 86,000 followers. And then just the idea that like it could just be gone and suspended and there's like almost no recourse that I could take like um, just because of how much protection these, these companies have. It was, it was just uh, really scary. And I was just like, you know, if, if something like that happened where I lost everything or I lost at least all my social media, I'm really grateful to be working with a company like Proco because they have, um, they have, you know, their audience. And so I was able to basically benefit from the audience that Stan Prokopenko has built with his great courses, amazing courses. And so I'm able to kind of piggyback on, on the reputation and the, the platform that he's built. So I'm grateful for that. And then, you know, same thing with Instagram. I'm, I didn't build Instagram, so I'm kind of piggybacking on the, the platform that somebody else put together. But at the same time, I'm helping to build it myself by creating content. So the idea that, that Instagram could just say, you know what, you know, those 85,000 people that you that decided, you know, voluntarily to follow you. Um, we just decided that they don't get to follow you anymore. And so we're going to take their ability to follow you away from them. And we're going to take your audience away from you. Um, that's just a scary thing that the, that these big companies have that much power to, uh, over, over the content creators because content creators are really the people that, that build the platform. If there was no content creators, there would be no reason to use these, these platforms. And so I'm hopeful that in the upcoming years, there will be laws that protect the rights of content creators and say, you know what, if you built an audience, there has to be some type of actual legal process where you can basically plea your case and say, no, I don't feel, or say, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't violate the, the guidelines or I certainly didn't violate them more than these other people and they still have their platform. And so I shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't lose everything that I've built up just because there's maybe a disagreement, whether it's politically or, or for some view or, or something like that. Like the thought police on these platforms is really, really scary. And there's a lot of people that are just like, well, they're big platforms. They can do whatever they want. I just don't agree with that. I think, they're, they've basically become the, the new um, place to have conversations. Uh, the, the new, basically, the new public square. So if you can't, if you can't, if you don't have uh, freedom of speech on these platforms, you don't have freedom of speech because these platforms are where people talk nowadays. So I think that needs to be kind of uh, solidified into law. And you need to be able to basically sue these platforms if they're discriminatory in a way that that uh, interferes with people's ability to speak freely and say what they believe to be true. JJ, I can't. Uh, I'm working, okay? That's my son knocking on the door. 
let's see. I think Twitch is the most money driven platform. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not on Twitch. I've heard about it. Um, but it's mostly like gamers and stuff that are doing doing things. So it's interesting. Um, but I, I have not invested any time in learning about that. But maybe I should you know. And there's there should maybe be a way to you know to be everywhere on every platform. But then the coordination between platforms is also kind of makes me nervous because if they ban you on one, they might ban you on all. It seems like there's kind of some type of collaboration between them. But yeah. Somebody says, oh no, don't go there. Why that they're that they're collaborating? Well, when somebody gets kicked off of one, they usually get kicked off of a bunch of them. It might not, you know, it doesn't have, it's not like, well, maybe it's it's not like they're in a, a room, but they just see that one platform does it and then that gives them a, an excuse. And especially if it's somebody that's controversial and they're kind of trying to appease the, the cancel mob. And so, yeah, I just, I just am... Uh, of the opinion that people should be able to say what they what they think. And, you know, artists art is just another form of communication. So if I, you know, whatever I create as an artist to express whatever whatever view, then you should have the freedom to do that. I think every artist should have the freedom to to do that. And if you can't if you can't do that, then So somebody says, don't go to Twitch. The platform is harsh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're like uh, strict on speech rules or whatever. I think I've heard something about that. Let's see. So I do have, I keep a little bit of clay in my freehand, and that keeps it soft so that uh, so that I can just grab little pieces this this piece is much harder I don't know if you can if you can see but I can push on these way harder so I just take off a little bit of clay and then keep it in my hand and that usually um, keeps it soft enough to to work love your art hey thank you I appreciate it I love making making art I love making that. Do, that doesn't sound right. I I enjoy creating art. See somebody saying Twitch is harsh and inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the the platforms. Like it wouldn't even be so bad if the platforms were just honest and they just said, you know what, if you're of this worldview or you're of this uh, opinion, you're not allowed on our platform. But what they do is they'll do these vague rules like uh, like no hate speech, and then they define it. And the problem with that is, you know, the question is always who defines it? Who defines what's hateful? Because what's hateful to me, you know, might somebody else might think that that's justified, you know. Somebody says, well, uh, people hate you for this or that, but that's justified. And it's like, well, well, who are they to decide what kind of hate is justified and what kind of hate is tolerable? So some some types of hate is are obviously tolerable. Like we should have a hatred of, you know, certain certain behaviors, certain uh, behaviors that people engage in that everybody agrees are wrong. Things like, you know, uh, sexual abuse and and pedophilia and things like that. Like everybody can agree that these things are wrong, that they should not be tolerated and they should be hated. But then there's a lot of gray area as well which is why I think that platforms should err should err on the side of allowing too too much content rather than on the side of too little but it is uh, I mean it is 
difficult. Like if I if I created a platform, maybe I would wanna um, push my push my views on people through that platform. So it's understandable that they want to do that. But I think once you become so big that you are basically the, the public square, that's when there has to be some rules that are in the public interest like um, you have the freedom of speech. That's what I think. So, um, but I was glad that I wasn't uh, kicked off of Instagram. I was thinking if I was kicked off and I had to start over, I probably just wouldn't even, I probably just wouldn't even worry about it. I might do some, like, try to figure out some ad campaigns, but I wouldn't try to rebuild from scratch. That's like, you know, it's like five years of working part-time, um, building content, making videos, making posts, and then it's wiped out. Like, if that happened, I'd just, I'd just be like, you know what, I'll just, I'll just cut my losses and uh, not use the platform anymore. So, but I was glad that, that that wasn't the case this time. You can make everyone happy. That's what I learned from social media for 13 years. Do you mean you can't make everyone happy? Sounds like, uh, I guess you said you can make everyone happy. And uh, I think that is difficult to make even most people happy. And that's really not, um, you know, the job of an artist. It's not the job of a, well, it's not your job to make other people happy unless they're, oh, yeah, can't, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really not a, your job as an artist to make people to make people happy is to make people, well, I guess to each his own, you know, if your artwork is, if you decide that your artwork is, um, the purpose of your artwork is to make people happy, then that's one thing. But as far as uh, people, you know, there's lots of people that create very offensive works of art. And, um, and I think that that should be allowed because I think there's so much more risk involved with censorship than with too much, too much speech. Because when things start to go off the rails, you have to be able to talk openly. If you can't, then, then what are you left with? You're just left with, um, if you can't get what you want or what you feel is justified to you through, through speaking and debating and, and the public forum, then people just turn to violence. And I think that that is a bad strategy so so people should just be able to speak even hateful even say hateful things um and the limits on these platforms should be just like the limits in the actual law so you can't defame people you can't um basically try to to dox people or get people injured by saying hey go attack this person that's already illegal so I think that these platforms are so public and they're so they're so almost governmental in the in their reach and in their influence that they should be required to abide by the laws that the American people have laid out that they have built their platforms, you know, enjoying these these protections that were given to them by the American people and so they should uh, respect those those laws in the American tradition of freedom of speech, freedom of, um, of religion, things like that. But it is, it's a complex issue. I've been thinking about that a lot lately and that, uh, and getting suspended, even though it was just for a day, you know, it makes you think, excuse my typos, I'm Polish. Oh, very cool. Polish, Poland. Yeah, I, um, yeah, learning, learning another language is not easy. I learned Spanish, but Spanish is is one of the easier languages to learn if you if you know English. Um, still, is not easy, especially learning it. I learned it when I was older, and so when you're older, you kind of 
and it becomes difficult to learn new languages. But, uh, but yeah, Spanish is a great language. Poland, that's so cool that we can communicate around the world. And so if you guys uh, like this type of uh, sculpting video conversation stuff, uh, be sure to check out the my my Patreon. That's where I do videos like this, where I'm just working and then talking. Mostly, you know, this one I'm, I'm talking about random stuff just because it's what happened to me this last week but uh, and what I've been thinking about. But usually it's just, you know, I'm just talking about sculpting principles, what I'm thinking about, what I'm trying to accomplish as I'm working. Let's see, I'm gonna look at this. And so, um, Patreon is where you can find that. Let's see, I feel like this, this part of the jaw is a little bit lower. I'm just gonna come with a, a loop tool. These are homemade um, loop tools that I have uh, built as just a pen with some some uh, epoxy two-part epoxy and then this is the part of a like a paper clamp that I took off and it works really well as a sculpting tool there's a lesson on the Proco 3d YouTube channel on tools for sculpture and I show how I made these so I'm just going to come under and try to clean this try to lube it up a little bit and clean it up Yo soy de España. Oh, yes. De España. Uh, mi esposa, a ella le gusta el acento de España, pero, uh, pero no le gusta cuando yo intento hablar de, de, de España. De España. Somebody from Spain. Very cool. That is, that is awesome. I should practice... Spanish more, but I don't practice it enough, and so I won't I won't attempt to do this demo in Spanish. But uh, I have thought about that because there's a lot of people that reach out and say, "Hey, are your videos in Spanish?" Well, they say it in Spanish, and I speak Spanish, so I'm like, maybe I should just make a Spanish um, speaking uh, YouTube channel for sculptors, you know, sculpture in in Spanish, and just take the videos that I've already done on the Proco 3D and then translate them into Spanish. Maybe that would be good. But I don't, yeah, I don't know if there's uh, a lot of people. It has it has to be, um, let's see, this I feel like is, um, it has to be worthwhile to, because it's a lot of work to, to translate everything. Ah, dice. Es sorpresa que hable español. Yo soy de México. Mi esposa es de México. My wife is is from Mexico, and so um, she came to the U.S. when she was really really young. But uh, yeah, she's from Mexico. My brother, yeah. Y mi hermano sirvió una misión. Uh, in Monterrey, Monterrey, Mexico. So my brother served a mission in Mexico, and that's where he met his wife. Ahí conoció su esposa allá, mi hermano, in Monterrey. Yeah, I should I should speak more Spanish, but but then half the people don't understand, and the other half. The other half might not understand anyway, and I'm rambling. Let's see, maybe I'll just bring this down a little bit. So I'm just looking at the, the cheekbones right here and just trying to get them fairly even from side to side. Just by adding clay by hand first, and then I'll come clean it up with a tool after. So I really do want it to be fairly symmetrical. Let's see, and then here I'm just looking on the screen, I can see that the, the line work got a little bit off. So I'm just going to come with a knife, clean that up. I 
it's looking better. Yeah, that looks better. And then sometimes I have this uh, this knife blade that's pretty flat, and I'll just roll it over to 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 clean up that line even further, make it even more um, precise. Yeah, do you see how much sharper that is? I don't know if it shows that much on a camera, but I can definitely see it here. Hablas muy bien español. Well, gracias. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody says you speak Spanish very well. I said thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's tricky learning another language, especially the the accent. El acento es es lo más no sé si es lo más difícil, pero sí es difícil. Y muchos muchos Gringos que intenten hablar español nunca nunca hablan bien con el con el acento y quizás yo tampoco pero eso es algo que quería intentar de de aprender a hablar con el acento como pero es difícil y cuando no lo hablo batallo más Pensar en las palabras y, y todo eso. But yeah, that's something that I really tried when I was learning Spanish, which is, you know, tricky. If you haven't learned a language, you should definitely try. It's it's almost impossible unless you go into the culture and then, and then, uh, and basically you're forced to, like you have to, uh, because it's just so difficult mentally if you didn't learn it when you were little. But if you do have the chance ever to go and, and immerse yourself in, learn uh, it is it's a great experience just to to be able to speak another language let's see i'm gonna i think i'm gonna turn this sculpture a little bit and try to work on this bottom area i'll try to put it in a way that hopefully it won't mess up you know some of the areas that i've been working on too much let me reframe But yeah. So, uh, so somebody's asking, I know it's a difficult question because both artists are very different, but which do you prefer, Bernini or Michelangelo? I, I really like Bernini, and so I'd have to go with Bernini. I got a lot of flack for, for saying that to somebody. I don't, uh, and that's just based on their artwork. I don't know a lot about them personally or their worldview or anything like that. But when I see the works done by Bernini, like if I could choose that mine would look exactly like a Michelangelo or like a Bernini, I would choose Bernini just because his style is just something I really like. It's uh, like hyper anatomical is what I call it, where the anatomy, it's like your understanding of the anatomy so informs the sculpture that it almost looks more realistic than real life. Like you see things that you wouldn't see in real life, um, and, you know, muscles and, uh, and bones and things, uh, just because of that grasp of that anatomy. And I just really like, uh, Bernini's way of rent it, uh, representing the feature, the people in, in stone. So that's something that I still, you know, I haven't actually done very many, realistic stone sculptures but that's something after i get the my my courses done my beginner courses then i'd like to do a, a course on stone sculpture maybe a more advanced course on stone sculpture and the courses the courses that i've put out are are an opportunity for me to 
like really dive into a, a subject and hopefully take the students along, but really like learn as much as I can about about it. And so I'm a much better sculptor I, than when I first started these courses, just because I've learned so much as I've gone along. And as I've thought like, well, what assignments could I do that would that would be good assignments for my students. And then I do the demos. And so I get to practice a ton. So um, that's something that I'd really like to do in the future is a stone sculpting course and then really dive into how do you make something look like uh, like that level of, of realism in stone. It's one of the most impressive things, especially back then when they didn't have as many, um, they didn't have the, the technology that we have today. And so it was all, you know, measuring and, and, and things like that that were, that were more, more primitive, but they were able to do, you know, such amazing works. So, yeah, that's what I'd, that's what I'd say about that. Bernini, I like his, his style. You know, but Michelangelo, he was, he was a very serious artist from very young. He did some amazing things. You know, the, the David, the, you know, it's like 18 feet tall. And an 18 foot tall, and I think the, the piece of stone was like 20 feet or something. Um, and so it, the, the stone alone is, is hundreds of maybe a hundred tons or something like that. Just the fact that they were able to move stone like that before they had tractors, before they had uh, the, the machinery that we have today, they, they were able to do it with, with the basic machinery that, that was available to them back then. It's just astonishing. It's just truly, truly incredible. And then what bothers me is that we have all this technology today and we don't create works of art like that. Like who is who is out there creating, you know, uh, stone sculptures that are a hundred tons that are as masterful as as Michelangelo's sculptures? And we could we could do it with a three D, you know, we could do it with with other tools. We could use three D scans, and we can use you know these big CNC stone machines that'll carve stone. But we just choose not to make beautiful things. We, everything becomes abstract and. And I'm, you know, abstracting this right now. And so I don't think that there's anything particularly wrong with abstraction of, of the, the figure, but just abstraction for abstraction's sake, just like by itself. I think that there, that the reason that people do that is just because it's hard to attack abstraction. It's like, well, where do you even begin? Because you can't say it looks, it, lo it looks unrealistic because it wasn't supposed to be realistic. So I think, um. I think a lot of artists use that to to as a kind of as a crutch or as an excuse or maybe it's just the maybe it's not the artist maybe it's the galleries and other people that promote extreme abstraction and um, and they just do that instead of promoting things that I think are more masterful and more um, more beautiful. So I hope that there'll be in, in the art world, I hope there'll be kind of a renaissance back to, back to sculpting things that are beautiful and, and, um, masterfully done. And I hope to be a part of that. But, uh, but we'll see. There's enough there's enough ugliness. We need uh, more, more beauty, I think. See, I'm gonna come in, try to clean this, this up a little bit. Yeah. I also prefer Bernini, especially as terracotta models. Yeah, I, I yeah, his, he's, he really, 
he really understood the the figure more than most that have ever lived and so that's good i'm not sure he was that i don't know much of his actual story i'm not sure if he was actually somebody that you'd want to hang around with but uh but he was a great artist and so that much i do really appreciate about him but then there's there's been some really terrible uh people that have been great artists so I guess art, you know, the, the skill of art follows people regardless of how good or bad they are. Let's see. So I'm looking at this right now, this area right in here. Um, and I'm trying to decide how I want this transition to take place. What I might want to do is take this transition right here that's at the cheek and just kind of follow it over. So I might want to carve out some more, have it come down, and then this transition just kind of follow, oh, just kind of follow back there. But I'm not positive that that's what I want to, to do. Might be a little bit low. In the meantime, I'm going to build up because the transition over here is lower on this this side. And just like that. Let's see, that's looking a little bit better. I might have gone too far. Okay, yeah, I think I will come cut this down a little bit more. So I think what I'm going to do is just Just roll this up but I want it to but I want it to kind of this plane to kind of flow into right there so I'll try to do that I'm trying not to mess up the the areas I've already worked on but I probably will so that's okay Yeah, it takes a while. So here I've been working for, how long has this been going? Um, for about a, an hour, it looks like. And so, so it just takes time to, especially during this last stage, to clean things up, make things look, look better. But I'd like to, eventually I'd like to mold this and cast it, and I think it'll be a good good piece that people might be interested in, having kind of a simplified sculpture. It'd be really cool to cast it in some type of metal, whether that's uh, bronze or, or aluminum or something. Let's see, I'm running into the, the inside of the sculpture. Or the armature, so I'm just gonna put some clay and squish that into.
So I'm just squishing that into in place because I was getting right at the the armature. So this is fu filled with just like newspaper that's been crumpled up and put together. So that's kind of what uh, what that's made of on the inside. Okay, I think I think I'm gonna end this right around here because um, well, just because. So thank you guys for watching. Really, thank you everybody that participated. That's really helpful. Um, if you're interested, again, please check out the the sculpting courses over at Proko.com. Those will be. A great resource if you're interested. There's a lot of free content over there. And then also my Patreon. Anyway, any support is really appreciated. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Andrew Joseph Keith. If you haven't subscribed to me here on YouTube, I hope you will. And I hope I'll see you again soon.